Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Ilya Toyanov to you, who was in my Adorno class today, and we really, I think we really had a great day with him in class. Um, he is he writes in German, so um, he is considered a German writer. But one of the reasons why uh, I could invite him here is because especially the novel that he's going to read from tonight is published in more than 25 languages. And uh, there's an English uh, translation, of course, called The Collector of Worlds. The German title is Der Weltensammler. Um, because Ilya Trojanov, as a so-called German writer, has a very unusual biography compared to other German writers. I will say a few words to his biography first. He comes from Bulgaria, and he has quite an interesting family background, too. And the family um, fled Bulgaria during the communist period, uh, when he was six years old, and they fled to Italy, and then fled Italy again, and ended up, first of all, in Germany, in Munich. So he went uh, to a German school first. Then his father, who was an engineer, got a job in Kenya. And uh, so the family moved to Kenya, and Ilya uh, went to an English boarding school in Nairobi for many years. In between returning to Germany, going to a German boarding school, then going back to Kenya, and then again studied in Munich uh, for a number of years, studied law, and uh, spent some time in Paris. And then he set up, that's how I first met him, he set up his own publishing house which is devoted to, or was devoted to African literature and German translation. Uh, when he started out as a writer, he's a journalist, a writer, a publisher, a translator. When he started out as a writer, he first started off, if I don't get it wrong, with non-fiction, so-called non-fiction books on Africa. And in 1996, he published his first novel in German, which, uh, immediately became a success in, in, on the German market and won some of the major German literary awards. And uh, so we've known us ever since. Actually, I, I met him because I worked for him. I did a job of translation. And I translated one of the novels by Nuruddin Farah, who came here last year, the Somalian writer. And actually, this novel, The Collector of World, is dedicated to Nuruddin Farah. So there's this kind of personal connection, too. But he's still a good writer, even though I <laughs> share the personal good connection. He's one of, actually one of the best contemporary German writers you, you can find at all. And the interesting thing is, actually, with this background he has, uh, it's very unusual, but uh, at the moment, really most of the best, or a lot of the best German contemporary writing comes from German writers with a non-German background. That's very interesting. It's not a big deal in English or American literature. It's very common. But for German literature, this is fairly new development. So, um, bless you. Um, he has published three novels so far. So what we're going to hear tonight are passages from his second novel that he worked on for seven years. And it's, it is devoted to a real historical character called Sir Richard Francis Burton, who was a British colonial officer and adventurer and scientist and uh, man of the world of the 19th century. And one of the things Ilya said today in class, that one of the reasons why he wrote this novel about Richard Burton, uh, besides the fact that he encountered him as a figure when he was a young kid, when he was looking at adventurous, famous adventurers in a book, and he found Richard Burton as one of the most fascinating characters. But he said, we still live in the 19th century. So this is not so much a historical novel, it's a contemporary novel, although it is set in the 19th century. And the fascinating thing about it, it is, it is a so-called post-colonial novel in the sense that Richard Burton, being part of the British colonial system, especially in India, um, um, doesn't really have a voice in the novel. He is the character, he's the object of three narrations. Uh, and and uh, the three narrations are, are related to three parts of the novel and three places where Richard Burton lived or where he went. The first part is India, where he was part of the East India Company um, as an officer. And uh, so you have the voice, among others, of his Indian, former Indian servant, 
who's telling his story, which is related to that of, of Richard Burton. The second part is set in Arabia because Richard Burton uh, managed to go on a hajj, on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And the third part is set in, in East Africa because he made the first expeditions to the sources of the Nile. And it's, it's told through the voice of his guide, which is actually, again, a historical figure who actually was the guide for four major ex expeditions, but is only very briefly mentioned in the huge uh, travel logs that exist of these expeditions. The second part that is said in Arabia is told to three different voices. And also three, the three parts follow a different literary form. In the first form, the first part you can call a, a confession. The second part has the form of interrogations. The third part you can call a collective memoir. So, so it's full of form, full of voices, uh, and it's beautifully written. It's a very rich novel. And again, it's, it's about us now, although it is set in the 19th century. So uh, well, please welcome Ilya Trojanov. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Oh, we'll start off again. Hi, good evening. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Martin. That makes life easy for me. All I have to do now is start reading. Um, I'm, I'm going to read from the beginning, and um, the reason is that one of the things that has always fascinated me was um, the question, how do you describe a rival? Because um, I think the huge question when you are describing the encounter with the unknown, the encounter with the other, is the question, do you actually, as a foreigner, ever arrive? And if so, when do you arrive? And one of the things that has bothered me in many other novels is that the moment the main character arrives, let's say, in Africa, um, he's already a very knowledgeable figure who knows his way around. He doesn't suffer through the different phases of incomprehension that are so typical of one's encounter with, with the unknown. So I, I actually wanted, in the very beginning, I wanted to give the reader a sense of what it meant, especially in those days when you had to um, when, when you had to first suffer a very long journey um, to reach India, this is 1842, um, how do you gradually approach the unknown and how do you gradually arrive, if, if at all? Um, now, people have asked me, so what is your answer to that question? When do you arrive? And my personal answer would be, you arrive when you lose your luggage. Um, so just see whether that kind of... Um, conforms with your own experience. First Steps After months at sea at the mercy of chance acquaintances and interminable chit-chat, his reading rationed by the swell, taking every opportunity to barter port for vocabulary with the Hindustani servants, asta asta in the doldrums, what a brute of a hangover, Katanak and Kabadar in the storm off the Cape, the waves attacking in sheer formation, the ship pitching so hard no one could keep their food down, and plenty more he had the devil of a job pronouncing. After months of this, the days began to grow even stranger. Everyone started talking to themselves, and still on they drifted across the Indian pond. Then, there it was, the bay. Bulging sails scooped up air like hands scoop water. The passengers finally glimpsed scenes that the ship's binoculars, with their smell of oil of cloves, had long since conjured up in their imaginations. Distinctions blurred. Were they striking land? Was land coming aboard? As the deck became a thronged viewing platform, a stage echoing with excited comment. It's a tabla. Interrupted in their conversation at the ship's rail, the group of British turned to find an elderly Indian simply dressed in white cotton standing directly behind them. He was somewhat smaller than his powerful voice, with a white beard hanging down to his belly, offsetting a high, smooth forehead. He was smiling at them in a friendly way, but he had stood very close all the same. 
a double drum, playing a ball of bomb and bay. The man produced two arms and two hands and began moving them in time to his deep voice. Left hand, the blessed bay, Bombahia. Right hand, Mumbai, the goddess of the fishermen. A teen tile of four syllables. I will show you, if you like. The man had already pushed in among them and began to drum on the rail with his index fingers, shaking his mane of hair. Bom bom bay bay, bom bom bye bye, mum mum bye bye, bom bom bay bay. Harsh and rough, as a rhythm that has rung out for centuries should be. Europe on the one sand, Europe on the one hand, India on the other. It's simple, really, if you're one of these people who, who can hear it. The man's eyes laughed gaily as a call went out for the more select passengers to seize land. The sloop awaited. India was just a few oar strokes away. Burton helped one of the women beside her with excitement down the ladder. When she was safely seated, her hands clasped in her lap, he looked back. The white-haired, white-bearded drummer was standing on the deck, stiffly upright, his legs splayed, his arms folded behind his back. His eyes rolled behind thick spectacle lenses. Go, go, but keep an eye on your bags. This is not Britain. You're entering enemy territory now. And his laughter flew away as the sloop creaked on ropes down to the sea. Landing revealed how their binoculars had deceived them. The dock rose over mounds of rotten fish, coated with urine and a slick of acrid water. Sleeves were hurriedly clamped over noses. Decay itself was accumulated centuries of putrefaction, trodden into a solid mass by bare feet, up and down which now marched a man in uniform, sweating and yelling. The new arrivals looked timidly around, their curiosity suspended until further notice. Leave everything to us. We'll be relieving you of all labor. Richard Burton parried the agent's vicious English proudly in measured Hindustani. He called to a coolie standing off to one side who was ignoring the commotion and having questioned, listened and negotiated, supervised the loading of his trunks onto a succession of backs and their transfer into a waiting cab. It wasn't far. The driver announced the fare was modest, and with that the carriage moved away into the mass of humanity like a barge under tow, caps and bald heads, turbans and toppies bobbing in its wake. Burton couldn't make out a single voice in the eddying press around him. It was a while before he could see something that made any sense at all. A shopkeeper's paws resting on sacks of rice outside the shop. Then the cab escaped the harbour and swung into a broad street and he leaned back in his seat. A youngster darted out, out of the way of the hooves at the last split second, testing his nerve and rewarded himself with a grin. A man was being shaved near whirling wheels. A child without skin was thrust towards him. Burton was horrified for a moment, then he forgot about it. The driver seemed to be telling him the names of the buildings on either side of the road. Apollo Gate, Ford, Secretariat, Forbes House, Sepoy. He pointed to a cap perch on the mop of greasy hair and below a set of thin, hairy legs sticking out of a pair of khaki shorts. Appalling, thought Burton. There's the native soldiers I'll be commanding. Damn it, those clothes are nothing but window dressing. Even the expression on the man's face looked, looks copied. The carriage curved past a cluster of women with tattoos on their hands and feet. Wedding, beamed the driver. The few upright constructions looked like attendants in a leper colony. Burton kept catching glimpses of grey-headed crows between the crowns of the palm trees. At one point, they were wheeling round a marble angel whose feet a veiled woman was kissing. Then, just before they arrived at the hotel, he, he, saw a hand, he saw a handful swoop down on a corpse. Sometimes, the driver turning round to him as they barreled along at full tilt, sometimes they don't wait for death. 
The British Hotel in Bombay bore all but no resemblance to the Hotel Britain in Brighton. In Bombay, higher prices were charged for less comfort and guests were required to find their own beds, tables and chairs. In Brighton, you also tended not to get drunken cadets with scrubby hair and swampy breath clambering on chairs in the middle of the night to goggle at you over a muslin curtain. Burton, no near asleep after hours of trying, snatched aside his mosquito net and pelted his neighbour with the very first thing he could find under his bed. A direct hit in the face. The fellow toppled off his chair and cursed softly until a candle was lit and a scream ran out. He had identified the missile, a rat Burton had killed with his boot a while before. In the ensuing volley of abuse, the fabric partition was the only thing protecting the lanky cadet from his own threats, as Burton reached back under his bed and pulled out a bottle of brandy. Now, Burton was something of a quack. He was a very, um, he loved to experiment as an amateur in, in medicine. And um, one of his medical wisdoms was that you wouldn't actually get sick in the tropical climate if you drank a bottle of brandy every day. <laughs> and um, as far as he know, he followed this recipe of utter and complete health in the nine years that he spent in India. Lizards were auspicious creatures, rats loathed, which explained why the lizards, lizards hang on the walls like colourful miniatures and the rats hid, not always successfully. Burton's neighbour on the other side was a medical orderly on his very first posting. He liked to sit on the window sill and look out to sea until the wind changed. When he'd call through the dormitory, Watch out! Rose Tendu coming this way! His, eye, his shouts of eyes and hatches shut would ring down the narrow stairwell onto the forehead of the dozing Parsi hotel manager who treated the guests with exaggerated servility. The Parsi would look up and shake his head irritably. These damned foreigners could only take the view of India if there, if there was a tailwind. The medical orderly refused to go to the cremation grounds with Burton. One must guard against wanton curiosity, you know, he explained, the dutiful son of his father sermonizing, taking his first steps away from the maternal fold. Burton attempted to sing the praises of an inquiring mind, but, as he soon realized, his experiences made no sense to the young man. He did, however, after a few days, manage to talk him into crossing Karnak Road, the thoroughfare that formed the border between the Empire's brains and its bowels. Burton had heard about Karnak Road at dinner with the magniloquent officials who governed entire districts, the provincial shopkeeper's sons and bailiff's descendants who, perpetually ferried on heathen hands between the shade and the cool, found themselves richer and more powerful than they could have ever imagined in their most brazen dreams. Their wives had meticulously drawn their wives had meticulously drawn up the map of prevailing prejudices for the sake of their new guest. Every one of their sentences was a danger sign, framed with Listen here, young man. Having thoroughly surveyed the terrain, they were convinced of the most appropriate way to describe India. The climate deadly. The staff simple, the streets septic, the Indian women all of the above, which is, <laughs> which is why, now listen carefully young man, they are absolutely to be avoided, even if with the passage of time certain bad habits may take hold, as if a little morality and self-control were too much to ask of our menfolk. All in all, now you won't hear a more honest piece of advice than this, your wisest course of action would be to keep well away from anything foreign. They plunged into the clogged lanes, brushing up against something at every step. 
Burton was jumping out of the way, his attention caught up by the bearers, the luggers, the, sho the shovers. Only the loads were visible in that human sea, huge blocks hovering and rolling on a swell of bobbing heads, lines of rag and bone shops, one identical workshop after the other. Merchants sitting on mats, fanning themselves in front of narrow entrances that led to bulbous, fly-blown caverns. Burton practically, practically had to beg these traders to sell him something, and when they had finally come round to the idea, they offered him the worst of their wares, tirelessly swearing to their excellence and vouching for them on their word of honour, until he accepted the particular small dagger or stone divinity in question. Then began the tug of war over the price, accompanied by renewed volleys of sighs and grimaces. At the conclusion of one of these bouts, the orderly remarked somewhat reproachfully, You speak these fellows' dialect awfully well. Burton laughed. The women from last evening would be horrified. I'm sure they believe that sharing a language is the same as sharing a bed. So this is the, um, the way Richard Burton arrives in, um, in India. And then as Martin um, explained, the story is told by his former servant. Now the former servant, basically the novel is a kind of not subaltern studies but subaltern fiction because the people who normally don't get to tell their story here are actually the storytellers. And, and the servant who was with Burton for nine years, his name is Naukaram, which in Hindi is a play of words. It means bo uh, both. Uh, Naukari means the servant, and it also means the boat of God. Uh, Nauka is boat, and, and the Ram, of course, is one of the names of God. Um, so this servant, after nine years, um, is sent back home because he got into a fight with the Italian cook and nearly killed the Italian cook. Um, I personally think that the Italian cook is to blame, but anyway, that's another question. Um, he's then sent home without a letter of rec recommendation. So he goes back home, and how is he to find a job with another British officer? And he's illiterate, so what he does is he goes to one of these public scribes, um, and he asks this scribe to basically write down all, the all his achievements, all his service, uh, so that with this piece of paper he could look for a new job. Now, unfortunately, it's the very hot month of May, and um, this particular scribe, who's a wily old fellow, has no other customers. So he decides to milk this client for all he's worth, and he explains to him that the only way he can actually come up with a convincing letter of recommendation is by knowing the complete story, because only by knowing everything could he then kind of... Um, write something that is dense and convincing and uh, will lead to, to a new job. So as days and weeks pass, everybody's waiting for the monsoon to set in, the servant Naukaram runs up enormous debts. He's asked everybody he knows in town or his relatives or his friends to loan him some money. And at a certain point, he goes to the scribe and says, listen, this is it. I have no more money. Just give me whatever you've written, and I will make use of that. At which point, the scribe is terrified because he's hooked on the story, mean, meanwhile, and he really wants to know how the story is going to end. So he says, no, you can't do that. I, I, listen, I, I'm prepared to, to write the rest of the story for free. And, and the servant says, no, that Malcolm says, that's not good enough. And the servant then, uh, the scribe then says, well, listen, I'll pay you. So for the second part of the first chapter, the tables are turned and the scribe pays the servant to hear the end of the story, which, as you probably noticed, is a very thinly con uh, concealed metaphor for the way that people like myself earn a living. Um, and it seems to work well. It's, it still does. Um, I don't know for how long. Um, now the third chapter, and I would like to read a longer section from the third chapter for a very simple reason that I'm, I'm in love with the main character, whose name is Sidi Mubarak Bombay, and as Martin mentioned, this was, this is a historical figure, but overlooked until recently, actually a few years ago the 
London Geographical, the Royal Geographical Society in London, for the very first time acknowledged that all the European explorers actually had local help. Um, <laughs> you know the famous poem by, by Bertolt Brecht, which uh, makes fun of the way we study history, and he says, well, you know, um, Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, so Brecht asked, well, wasn't there at least a cook um, with him, and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit like that. Um, the amazing thing is that the way I was taught African exploration, and I was taught African exploration in some detail because um, I grew up in Kenya, but the way I was taught these fabulous, usually British explorers, arrived and uh, came, saw, and conquered. Um, and I, I, even as a kid, I remember wondering, how is that possible? How do you find your way in a place you've never been to before? And how do you orient yourself in, in a vast country that is utterly unknown to you, in uh, amongst people whose language you don't speak and uh, with no means to your disposal? And the reason is very simple. There were 100 porters with them, and they had a local guide, and, and this guide, the first professional guide of African exploration, is Sidi Mubarak Bombay. Now, you might wonder why he has this peculiar name. The reason is he was a slave, and in those days, especially the, the slave trade um, across the Indian Ocean, which was just as, as brutal as the better-known slave, uh, slave trade across, across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, one of the ways to kind of... Um, demean um, the slave and, and to rob him of his um, traditional identity and um, to basically subject him was to take away his name and to give him a new name and often the new name was the name of the place where he, a geographical name, where he either w where he was sold into slavery or where he arrived. So in this case Sidi Mubarak Bombay was sold to a trader, a Gujarati trader in in Bombay, so he was given the name of that town, so its name became Sidi Mubarak Bombay. Um, now, many, many years later, he's an old man. He's sitting in front of his stone porch in the old city of Zanzibar, which is, uh, I don't know whether anyone has been there. It's an uh, incredibly atmospheric and beautiful place, uh, World Heritage Site. And um, because Islam is the prevailing religion there, um, according to local custom, um, male guests who are not relatives are not allowed in the house, which is why you have these stone benches in front of every house where the men would meet after the evening prayers and would chat. And he's very fond of telling his stories, um, of course, his heroic stories, and he makes fun of the Europeans, the two Europeans. One is Richard Burton and the other is uh, uh, John Hanning Speak. And the problem with that, that is why uh, Martin called it a collective memoir. The problem is that all the friends have heard the story, the stories many times before. Um, so basically, they are commenting and uh, changing and exploring well known stories that are no longer the stories of the individual city of Mobile Bombay. They've become the stories of this particular group of friends. Um, and um, as Martin mentioned, the aim of that particular expedition was to find the sources of the Nile. And to me, it's a beautiful expression of the lunacy of this particular um, exploit, because as you probably know, the Nile has no source. The Nile flows out of Lake Victoria, and thousands of rivulets and uh, streams and big and small rivers flow into Lake Victoria, so it's only a question of definition um, when we discuss the question uh, as to where the, 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 the sources of the Nile might be. Um, okay, so these are the old men, and um, one of them asks, by the way, Sidi, what is the... Se oh, I have to explain two things. Uh, there, there are a few Kiswahili words. One is Bwana, which means something like Sir or Sahib in, in Hindi. And, and the other one is uh, Mzungu Wazungu. Mzungu is singular, Wazungu is plural. And um, it's basically used to, uh, when, when uh, Africans, uh, East Africans speak, uh, speak of white people. So most tourists actually think it means literally white people. 
Well, actually, it means those who walk around in circles. <laughs> and I remember, actually, many years ago, after a reading, I just explained this. I went to my hotel room, and uh, I don't have a TV at home, so the only time I get to watch TV is when I'm in a hotel room. And so I'm very eager to see what this wonderful new invention has to offer. And, and I switched on the TV, and I saw the Paris Dakar rally. And someone had got lost. Um, so the footage was from a helicopter, and you could see the rally car driving around in the bush in circles. <laughs> and I thought to myself, something's never changed. The Wazungu are still trying. They're not walking around in circles now, they're driving around in circles. <laughs> so, Sidi, what is the, the second Great Lake called, by the way? Nyanza. That is what the man who knew the other bank told us. But Buona Speak wasn't satisfied with that name. He wanted another name. Every place he saw on this trip, this short trip we took without Buona Burton, he immediately gave a name, as if he were giving gifts to the children of poor families. The minute he decided on a name, he ordered me to tell the porters. I would pass on the name to them, and they were amazed by this custom. They couldn't make sense of it. Perhaps he can only remember what he has named himself, one of them suggested. Before Buona Speak knew what the other shore of a lake or the other side of a hill or the other end of a valley looked like, he had already given it a name. While we were still gasping for air after the steep climb, he called the hill on which we got our first sight of the second great lake. Somerset. The little bay at our feet he called Jordan. One of the rocks that stretched into the water became Burton Point and part of the Lake Speak Channel. And a small group of islands was given the name the Bengal Archipelago. And the, the lake itself, this lake that seemed as broad as the sea, in a solemn voice, as if he was speaking in the council of the elders, he named Victoria. The Wazungu still call this water Victoria. And now that they have raised their flag over our port, who knows, perhaps it will be called after one of their women for years to come. Most of the Wazungu are proud of this name because they think the lake is named in honor of their queen. <laughs> but Buona Speak told me a little later that evening it was just happy chance. His mother had the same name as the queen of his country, and so he could dedicate the lake he had discovered to his mother without fear of being accused of anything inappropriate. But Sahib, I said, the lake already has a name. The lake is called Nyanza. Nonsense, cried Buana speaking. I felt the anger coming to a boy when him. How can it have a name? I only discovered it today. <laughs> His words bewildered me. I thought about them for a long time and finally reached the conclusion that it couldn't do any harm if the lakes and the mountains and the rivers had several names, names from different mouths for different ears that spoke of different features and different hopes. But there was one thing I hadn't counted on. I had sown too close to the water and overlooked the danger of flooding. The Wazungu would only accept one name for everything. They are stubborn as mules. They won't tolerate the different names a place can have. When we returned to Kaze, where Buona Burton was waiting for us, and we talked about the lake to the Arabs there, Buona Speak insisted on calling it Lake Victoria. I had to explain to the Arabs that Buona Speak said Victoria but meant Nyanza, at which one of the Arabs said with a sharp tongue, why doesn't the Mzungu say what he means? Does he want to hide something? As always when things got difficult, Buona Burton stepped in, soothing the waters with his Arabic that flowed from his mouth like melted butter. But there were times, I won't hide this from you, when Buona Speak asked me to tell him the local names, so he could write them in tiny letters next to the names he had given the places. I found out the names and I told them. 
not only Nyanza for the Great Lake, but Ukareva for the islands on the Great Lake, and so on. And so his book would have contained his invented names and the traditional names side by side if we had not been invited to a feast where we drank banana beer. We drank so much banana beer the taste was still sticking to my tongue days later and the meat broth and the sweet potatoes and everything else tasted of banana beer. You know I don't drink, but it was the only thing that could revive us. We had been invited by the men of the village. They had brewed the beer in our honour and all the porters drank with me. We didn't hold back that evening. We licked our wounds and cursed the journey and the wazungu at the tops of our voices. Then another guest of the village told us about a man living on the other shore of that very lake who called the lake Lolwe. We asked him what that meant and he said it was the name of a giant who was so big he made the lake every time he relieved himself. <laughs> a little lake or a medium lake as the case may be and one night he let fly so much water, more than ever before, that the next morning people were staring at a lake without banks. Now, since there are many American students, as far as I could gather during the day, it might interest you to know that this is a myth or a legend of, this, of um, a nation in Kenya called the Luo, who live um, on the east, uh, eastern banks of um, Lake Victoria. And the Lu have become reasonably famous because one of their sons produced another son who is now the president of uh, the USA. So um, actually for, for a moment, I, a few years back when, when Obama was uh, voted into power, I actually thought whether I should write him a telegram congratulating him and asking him whether he knows of the giant Lolwe and how Lake Victoria had been had come about. So the next morning people were staring at the lake without banks. <laughs> he had been drinking too much banana beer. Hey, far too much. It was a fine story. And what we thought was a wonderful idea came out of it. Why not make up names for places like him and give them to the Mzungo to take back to his country? We could give him names that would make fun of anyone who read them without realizing they were being made fun of. Names like Great Emptying of the Bladder for the <laughs> lake on the bank of which we had drunk so much banana beer. <laughs> it was a lovely idea and we got on with it immediately. We thought up names while we were drinking banana beer and Next morning, our names found their way into Buana Speak's notebook. What do these people call this river? He asked me, and I answered, the people of the Wakareve call this river monkey's tail riddled with lice. <laughs> and when he asked me the name of a hill, I answered, the people of the Wakareve call this river, uh, this hill rump covered with warts. <laughs> And when he wanted to know if a gorge had a name, I told him, the people of the Wakareve call this gorge where a man goes in and a baby comes out. <laughs> and uh, now don't give me such a horrified look, Baba Kudos. It was a crude joke, I know. But not as crude as the joke Buana Speak permitted himself when he filled the whole world with his names. Ah, wait, I, I've remembered another one. <laughs> Uh, the best one actually. Uh, there were two hills that were very much alike and their name, I'm sure you've guessed, in the language of the people of the Wakareva was the Flabby King's Tits. <laughs> uh, we were pleased with our jokes and forgot about them until the next journey when Hamid, my firstborn, was old enough to walk. Buana Speak showed me the maps he had made in his country and he read to me the names of the places we had seen together. And I heard the name Victoria and the name Somerset. And then he showed me some small writing. And he pronounced that this was the names I had told him were used by the people who lived there. I asked him to read out some of them and 
Sure enough, even though he chewed up the words in his mouth, you could still understand them. He said, I'm covered with boards, and he said, the flower king's chits. And, and believe me, my brothers, never have I had so much trouble in my life controlling the laughter that was trying to burst out of me. So if I went to the Wazungu's country and bought one of these maps, I could read all your childish jokes. Ah, oh, yes, Baba Ali, but you've got to hurry. The Wazungu are conscientious. Another Wazungu may soon travel there collecting fresh knowledge. Their maps are constantly redrawn. It's a favorite game of the Wazungu. No, it's more than a game. People's pride depends on it. And in the end, Buana Burton and Buana Speaks' friendship was dashed to pieces. So that is from the narrative of Sidi Mubarak Bombay, which is um, not always that funny. It's sometimes uh, rather grim. Um, did we want to have a discussion as well? Well, maybe we read a little more. A little more, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's read the love scene. Um, <clears throat> now, Sidi Mubarak's wife, um, he acquired the wife on this first expedition, and he, he literally acquired it because he bought her. And not only did he buy her, but um, as she found out much later, he bought her with stolen goods because he was actually in charge of the, the copper um, that they carried with them because copper was one of the means of payment. So he just took some of the copper and, um, and bought his wife with that. And um, this, of course, has been an ongoing issue between the two of them, partly in jest, partly, of course, uh, in offense. But nevertheless, this is an old couple who have found a way of respecting and loving one another. And so this is a love scene between two very old people. Sidi Mubarak's, Sidi Mubarak Bombay's wife, his wife acquired with brass wire and retained with affection, grates coconut in the kitchen puts the rice to soak, and adds the pieces of fish to the pot where the curry is simmering, chilly red. She hears his voice in the adjoining room, still talking. There's never a lull once Sidi Mubarak Bombay has set sail on a story. The winds are always set fair. She isn't really listening, though, as she drains the rice, concentrating instead on the throbbing pain in her left side, a pain that had at first discreetly announced it itself, like a guest who sits humbly in the corner, happy with any crumbs you care to offer him, before gradually growing greedier as the months passed. Now her guest is polishing off more than she is prepared to give, and none of the herbs which the doctor gives her, and she carefully pounds as instructed, bring her any relief. She focuses on the pain as she cooks, and her husband carries on with his story. Absorbed in what she is doing, suddenly something makes her prick up her ears, some words suggesting a story she hasn't heard before. After all the years they have spent together, this blustering, vain, gnarled tree knot of a husband can still dish up new stories, still add spices when the routine is threatening to grow stale. How? Can he still surprise her after all these years? This time with the memory of a man who he met on his last journey, a journey he took immediately after Hamid's wedding, which he rarely talks about, his fourth journey, on which he came across a European who decorated his neck and head with the most incredible things. This strangely adorned man collected the future's cast-offs, cast the tree knot was saying outside her kitchen, and she didn't know what he meant by, the, by, <clears throat> by these words that penetrated her tiredness. But even so, she stopped cooking and went closer to the passage so as not to miss a word, just as before she had taken care not to waste a grain of rice. Every time the tree knot went on, this strange man found some broken-off piece of metal or old cart cart 
cartridge case or empty bottle in the path, he couldn't help himself. He had to pick it up and look at it. And from then on, he couldn't be parted from it. He couldn't throw it away. He had to draw a hole in each one of these objects he had picked up and thread them on the chain he always wore around his neck. A weird necklace from which dangled half a dozen medicine bottles, the key to a sardine can and different bits and pieces of metal. Now she understands. The foreigner, this strangely adorned character, wore on his body bits of rubbish left by the caravans that had passed through the country. And Sidi Mubarak Bombay, her husband, whose peculiarities she will never get used to as long as she feels anything, went on four of these caravans. If his stories are to be believed, he even guided them. And that is why, in his own lopsided way, he is delighted by this foreigner who adorned his body with the skins of his old journeys. A smile spreads across her face. There truly is no one else like him, this childish old man who keeps surprising her afresh. When she tells him the food is ready, he says conciliatorily, let's eat together this evening. They mix the curry with the rice and in silence shape the rice into balls with their fingers. He only eats a little, but she can see that he's enjoying it. When he leans back from the table, she, she's, she slowly heaves herself up and brings him a bowl of water to wash his fingers. Then she leaves him to go and tidy up in the kitchen and boil the water that she pours in the bucket and puts in the bedroom before calling. The water is ready for your bath. When she sees him again, he's only dressed in a kikoi. She looks at his gnarled body as he sits on the bed, barefooted, and she remembers how strange the thought of being with a man shorter than her had struck her as a girl. When she had begun to trust him a little, she had ventured to bring up the subject of his height. He had laughed. Yes, but that is also why I'm strong and not easy to knock down. I may be restless, but I can't be torn up by the roots. And that has proved true. Learn to know the tree you want to lean against, her father had advised her. She hadn't been able to choose the tree, but the man she had been sold to had always borne the weight she had put on him. Buana, she says slowly, savouring every word, I am your wife. Let us make love, Buana. I feel a desire. Sidi Mubarak Bombay sighs, looks up and walks deliberately over to her on the bed. It takes a certain effort these days, but it still brings them joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.